All right, well, this is one of my favorite chapters, and I'm excited to talk about this subject. We could spend hours on it, but we're not going to do that. We're going to keep it short, because we want to take a little bit at a time. We don't want to, you know, you don't want to do too much at any one meeting. But let's get started with a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the, your word and uh, how it is amazing how it reveals the future in such amazing detail. Lord, we're going to study that tonight. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding as we open your word. We might grasp the significance of the events of the past and how they inform us about the future. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kingdoms in collision. Perfect, perfect title for this subject. Um, you know, just a summary of what we studied. Chapter 1, you remember... Those of you who are here, anybody remember what chapter one was about? Anybody remember? Image. Almost. Chapter two was the image. Chapter one was when Daniel and his, and his companions were brought to Babylon, you know, and they were trained to fill positions of, author, of, of responsibility, but they were given food and wine that was not okay according to their beliefs. There's you know, unclean foods and wine. They did not drink alcohol and they didn't eat unclean foods. That was a very important principle in the Jewish system. And so they begged the uh, Melzar, the, the, the one in charge, please give us pulse. Now pulse is, is really another word for vegetables. You know, it was. I'm sure they had rice and vegetables, and they, they had uh, they, they had carbohydrates. But but to remember the the leader, the Melzar, <coughs> who was in charge, said, Daniel, if you look thin and sick, the king will take off my head. <coughs> and Daniel said, Look, Melzar, don't just give us ten days trial, just a ten day trial. And Melzer said, <laughs> okay, but just 10 days. Well, what happened? The Bible tells us that in 10 days, they, they got the vegetables, they got the rice, and the, the rice and vegetables, the carbohydrates and the vegetables. And the, other, the other, other people, there were other young men there that were being trained too. They ate the king's food. But Daniel and his friends looked fatter and healthier than all the others. God blessed their faithfulness. You know, it, 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 was, it, it was an ironic situation because here they were, con they were, they were slaves. They were, they, I mean, let's face it, they were just captives. And yet, already God is showing that he's the real God. See, the Babylonians said, thought that, well, we conquered we conquered Jerusalem, therefore our gods are better than your gods. You know, our gods are stronger. That's how they all thought. They all thought that. You know, they always bragged about their gods, right? And so it appeared that the Babylonian gods were winning and in control, but then Daniel shows them, God of heaven, he's still, he's the real God. So Jan, chapter one, it was about this uh, issue of, of turning defeat into victory. And that's what they did. Chapter two, remember that one? That was a dream. Who had the dream, remember? It was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, wasn't it? It wasn't Daniel's dream. It was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And, and Nebuchadnezzar called all his wise men, all his magicians, and all of his spiritual gurus. And he said to them, tell me the dream. I had a dream, and it is an important dream. But I don't remember. And he said, tell me the dream. Well, all these gurus said, king, <laughs> You tell us a dream, and then we'll tell you the interpretation. And the king said, look, you're the spiritual gurus. You're the guys who are supposed to communicate with the spirits. You should tell me the dream. He said, oh, we can't do that, king. Nobody's ever asked any king to do that, any, any magician to do that. And he got so angry, he said, he said, execute everyone, all of them. And, of course, that included Daniel, right? Daniel and his companions. And Daniel said to the Melzar, well, why, why is the king executing all the wise men. And he said, well, because he had a dream and no one can tell him. Let me go before the king. So he goes before Nebuchadnezzar 
and says, please, give me 24 hours. Give me, give me one day. Give me, give me time. And I will appeal to my God. And then we'll see. So he did. They prayed that night. They had a real prayer meeting. Can you imagine what that prayer meeting was like? You know? <laughs> the next day your head's coming off. <laughs> if, you don't, if God doesn't intervene, you're, you're done. So they had a prayer meeting. They prayed. And that night, God revealed the dream to Daniel. Amazing, huh? And in this, this is a dream. It was, if you remember, it was a dream of an image, and it had different metals. It had gold for the head, silver for the for the chest, brass or bronze for the for the thighs, and then legs of iron. They represented kingdoms, kingdoms. Now, of course, Daniel didn't know the names of the kingdoms, but we know the names of the kingdoms. The first one, of course, was Babylon. And we know that Babylon was conquered in 539 by Medo-Persia, by the Persian kingdom. So we know that the silver was Persia. And then we know what happened to Persia, right? 331 BC, Battle of Arbella, Alexander the Great smashed the Persian army for good and took over the Persian Empire. We know that, that Greece, didn't, Greece didn't last forever, right? Greece lasted until about 169 when the Romans smashed them in the Battle of Pydna. And pretty much, that was not quite the end, but it was the beginning of the end for the Greek Empire. And in just a few more years, they were gone. And so Rome took over. So we know that these are a sequence of kingdoms. So that was Daniel chapter 2. Um, and then, of course, um, we come to uh, Daniel chapter 3. Now, in Daniel chapter 3, you have what? You have Nebuchadnezzar rewriting history, right? He sets up this image in the, goal, in the plain of Dura. And instead of having different metals, it's all gold. It's all one metal. And Nebuchadnezzar was trying to rewrite history and say, my kingdom will last forever, right? And he made everybody, he said everybody had to bow down to it, right? And... Everybody did, except for three. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't happy about that, so he threw them in a furnace. Fiery furnace. But what happened? Jesus entered the furnace with them. And Nebuchadnezzar looked. Oh, no God can save like that. He was just astonished. And he said, come out. And they came out, and they were not, none, not of their, none of their clothes were burned, their hair wasn't singed. And he acknowledged that their God was the true God. So that was, that was chapter 3. And uh, chapter 4 is the, uh, well, let me double check. <laughs> I should have memorized it. Uh, uh, let's see. I think that's the one where he's... Uh, yeah, he's seven years as an animal. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. And in this dream, in this dream, he saw a tree. And it, it, uh, it, this tree was a huge tree, and all the birds were in the tree, and all the animals were sheltered in the tree. But then, but then there was a holy watcher that came and said, chop down the tree. And they chopped down the tree and put a band on it. And Nebuchadnezzar asked his astrologers and his magicians again to tell him what the meaning was. And uh, they couldn't do it. So they called in Daniel. He called in Daniel. Now Daniel immediately understood the significance of the dream. And, uh, and he didn't want to tell the interpretation. He didn't want to tell it because he said, oh, and the king, this dream should be for your enemies. See, he loved Nebuchadnezzar. Even though Nebuchadnezzar was his, was, you know, was, was his captor, captor, he still loved him. He said, I want this dream to be for your enemies. And, he said, well, what? and Nebuchadnezzar said, well, well, Daniel, don't worry. Just, just go ahead. Tell me the interpretation. He says, oh, king, you are this tree. But because you are not giving glory to God, your reason will be taken from you. And for seven years, you will lose your reason. You will go about like a wild animal. And Daniel counseled him, look, cut off your sins by doing righteousness, by showing mercy to the poor. 
Well, Nebuchadnezzar probably paid attention to that for a little bit. But about a year later, he was out on his porch, you know, overlooking this big city, Babylon, which is a beautiful city. And he said, look at this Babylon. Huh. Is this not great Babylon that I have built by my power? And then immediately the word was, was, was announced, your reason is taken away from you. You shall go about like a wild animal. And for seven years he went about like a wild animal. Now imagine, imagine. For seven years, he lost his reason. He, was in, he, was just a, he had the mind of an animal, and he went about on all fours. And at the end of seven years, he looked up to heaven and acknowledged the God of heaven, and his reason was returned. Right? Now imagine. What's the most amazing thing about this story is all of his associates say, come on, king, come back to your throne. Can you imagine vacating the White House, White House for seven years and getting it back? <laughs> you know? It was miraculous. But some, some not, we don't know for sure, but some scholars think that, uh, guess who was running the show while he was out grazing on the grass? Daniel. Daniel. He was probably running the show. Okay, so that was, that was chapter 4. And then, oh, my, we have chapter 5. That was, that's amazing. That was when Belshazzar decided to uh, have a feast. He was going to have a birthday party. And, uh, you know, I read, I read one time that, that Darius, who was the, 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 in charge of the Medo-Persians, was watching Babylon. And his armies had come and circled Babylon. And he knew that on this particular night, there was going to be a big party. And they were going to be drunk. And he says, that's the night I will attack Babylon. And he diverted the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River went down, right down the middle of, of Babylon. Right down the middle. He diverted it into a riverbed, a dry riverbed. His, his troops marched right in the middle of the city. And it still would have been safe for the Babylonians. But one thing, there were gates that, you know, separated the river from the rest of the city. They left the gates open because they were drunk. And those Medo-Persian troops marched right into the city and took it over in one night. And that was predicted, by the way. I told, we talked about that. I won't go into it in too much detail. But in Isaiah 45, 150 years, 150 years before, before uh, Belshazzar was born, Isaiah predicted that Cyrus would conquer Babylon in one night. You can read in Isaiah, just look at Isaiah uh, chapter 45, verses uh, 1, through, 1 through 5. And so then, then we, have, uh, then we have, of course, chapter 6, which we went over last time. Of course, in the lion's den, uh, they were jealous, jealous of Daniel, because, uh, you know, amazing story. There's an amazing story to this, because the Persians take over the kingdom, right? Now, Darius is the, is, is first, the first king. He's, it, says, it says he's 62 years old. He, they, scholars say he reigned for one year, and then he died. And Cyrus, then the Persian, took over. But Cyrus was so impressed by Daniel that he made him prime minister. And the others were jealous. And so they came up with a scheme to get him in trouble where they made... They made uh, Cyrus, uh, uh, well, it was, I'm sorry, it was Darius, pass a law. Yeah, Cyrus came later. Darius was, was just, he, Darius was for the first year. He was, and so it was Darius, it was Darius the Mede. By the way, nobody has ever been, found any evidence of his existence, but we have it in the Bible, so we believe it. But Darius the Mede promoted him, and the others were jealous of, of, uh, of Daniel, so they said to Darius, look, make a, make a law that no one can pray to any god except you for 30 days. And so they did. And then Daniel kept praying, and so they brought him to the king and said, you've got to put him in the lion's den. They put him in the lion's den, and nothing happened to him. And he was rescued from the lion's den. So that's where we're at. Now we're on Daniel. Now we're on 7. And this is a um, prophetic. The first six chapters are mostly historical. But now, except for Daniel chapter 2, but now we're moving into prophetic, the prophetic chapters. And so now we're going to look at 
another dream that Daniel has. What scene, does, what scene does Daniel describe in his dream? What does he see and what vision does it contain? Well, it says in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head were out on his head, on his bed. And then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Okay? Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Winds in the Bible represent strife. And sea represents people. We'll see that in a minute. So what's happening here is you have political strife stirring up people. You have conflict, right? Four beasts come up out of the sea. And they're each different. So we see that there's a great storm, four winds stir up the sea, and four beasts. So each beast represents a kingdom. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Okay? The Bible is very clear that, that these beasts represent nations, kingdoms. Now remember in Daniel chapter 2 we had metal. Now we have beasts. The metal, now this is what some scholars say, the metals represent the temporary nature of these kingdoms. Okay? The beasts represent the conflicts, the interactions between these nations. You know, the, 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 one of the principles of, 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 of both interpreting Daniel and Revelation is a principle of repetition and enlargement. What the Bible does, it kind of gives us an outline in Daniel 2, and then it repeats almost the same thing in Daniel 7, but it enlarges. So it's, it's kind of like it's a really good teaching principle. You know, if you want to teach, you know, I used to be, a, I, used to, I, used to be a, I was a college professor, and, and one thing you have to do is you have to repeat, right? But you don't repeat exactly the same thing because it's boring. So what the Bible does is it gives the same information but it does it with different symbols to make it interesting and brings out more information. I think it's fantastic. And that's what's happening in Daniel 7. These beasts are representing the same kingdoms, but they're bringing out different information. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom. Verse 23. Water, this is important, water represents people. People. How do we know? Revelation 17, 15. The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So when you see these beasts coming up out of the sea, they're coming up among people, population. Wind represents strife or destruction. Jeremiah 49. I will scatter to all winds those in the farthest corners. I will bring their calamity from all sides. There's also a really interesting text in, in Revelation. I didn't put it up on the board. But in Revelation chapter 7, there's a very interesting text about wind. It says, After these things I saw the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, standing, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. It says, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on the four. Now the winds bring destruction. Winds are strife. Winds hurt. Do not harm the earth, the sea. So winds are strife. So what four beasts did Daniel see in the vision? Well, the first was like a lion. And it had eagle's wings. Right? That's the first one. I watched till its wings were plucked up. It had wings on it, but they were plucked up. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. One of the amazing things about these prophecies, if you, if you, study, the, if you study the descriptions carefully, there's all kinds, it's communicating all kinds of, of nuances and information. There's a lot of information in those few verses, as we'll see. A man's heart was given to it. 
So three things happen to this, this lion. First of all, its wings are plucked up. Now, what does that indicate? I, I think it indicates a loss of speed and agility. Now, in warfare, is speed important? I don't know what general it was. I don't know if it was a MacArthur or, or, um, <laughs> or um, some other, um, uh, um, you know, some other general, famous general. But one general said the key to what, winning a battle is to get the most men to the right place fast. Whoever gets there quickest is going to win that battle. Being able to move your men quickly in position, you win the, you win the battle. Maybe, maybe it was um, Alexander the Great, I don't know. But he's made to stand up like a man, which means what? Loss of strength. Is a lion stronger than a man? Yes. Now, David in the Old Testament, right? He, he actually killed some lions. I don't know. This guy, that guy must have been amazing. But typically, the lion kills a man, right? <laughs> That's the way it usually works. So loss of strength. And a man's heart was given to it. A man's heart is not as, well, loss of courage, right? So here, here the Bible is describing not only that Babylon was, it, not only is this is lion Babylon, but it goes to a transformation. You know, Babylon didn't last very long. It conquered about 605, and then it was defeated in 539, about 70 years. It didn't last very long. But at first it was, it, it was like unstoppable. Nobody could defeat it, right? And then there's another beast like a bear. A bear is pretty ferocious too, right? <laughs> ever, ever seen a bear? Anybody? Close up? I've seen bear far away. <laughs> I didn't get very close. <laughs> but uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, uh, well, my father-in-law at one time, he, he was an outdoors man. He told says, a bear with his paw can rip off your shoulder. Just nothing, like nothing, right? Powerful beasts. The second kingdom is a powerful kingdom, a, like a bear. And it's raised up on one side. Notice the descriptions. It doesn't just tell us, you know, okay, one, two, three. It doesn't, I love this about the Bible. It doesn't just tell you, it's, like a, it's not like a history book tells you, well, this kingdom and this kingdom and this kingdom. No, it tells you, it describes them. It describes them, you know? There's something important about this being raised up on one side. There's, there's a meaning to that. Yeah? And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to it, Arise, devour much flesh. This kingdom <laughs> whomped all over the known world. <laughs> you know? This, there, was no, there, was no, there was no fighting this power. It was, it was unstoppable. So three points about this. The bear is raised up on one side, okay? It had three ribs in its mouth, and it devours a lot of flesh. So it's powerful. It's powerful. And then, after this, he saw another beast look like a leopard. Leopard. Which had on its back four wings of a bird. Wow. Wow, leopard. What's the leopard think of? What do you think of a leopard? And wings? This, this, and this kingdom had speed on steroids. Yeah? It also had four heads, which means it had divided leadership at one time. Four heads. Okay? So, just to, re just to kind of recover, just to kind of re recapitulate, uh, summarize, leopard is fast and agile. Now, that's significant in military conflict, right? That's very significant. Very, very fast, four wings. The Bible's trying to tell us, whew, this, this is lightning fast. And four heads, division of leadership. Uh, so, and after this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces. In other words, it was just chewing up the kingdom before. 
and trampling the residue with his feet. That was total conquest, total domination. You know, it, I shouldn't say this, but in football, what everybody wants is domination. They want one team, you know, just crush everybody else. This, this kingdom crushed everybody else. That's exactly what was happening here. It was different from all the rest that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, three points about this. There was no animal that could describe the cruelty of this power. This power was so cruel, so awful, so dreadful, there just isn't an animal out there that'll describe it. So he just calls it this dreadful, terrible, I don't know, it's almost like a dragon or something. It has total domination, total conquest. Nobody could stand up to it. And it had ten horns. It's very significant, ten horns. Remember the metal image? Ten toes? Maybe there's a connection there, yeah? Maybe. So, just to review, four beasts that, Dan, that, he, that he saw. A lion with legal's wings, a bear with three ribs, a leopard with four heads and four wings, and a very strong beast. This is an artist's portrayal. We don't know what Daniel really saw. But you can see, the first one is the lion with the wings. Then you have the leopard with the four wings. And you have, well, you have the bear next. And then the leopard. And then this, this kind of a dragon-like beast. It's so, just so terrible. So remember, in Daniel chapter 2, there was an image. And it predicted the rise and fall of kingdoms. And Babylon was the first. Babylon was, was known. It's, you go to any secular book, any secular history book. I mean, the neat thing about this is you can go to an encyclopedia. You can see it's, it's exactly right. You know? Uh, you don't have to go to a religious book. <laughs> you don't have to go to the Bible. You can, go to, you can go to any history book and it'll tell you Babylon was a glorious kingdom. It didn't last long. True, it didn't last long. But it, when it was in power, it was powerful and it was rich. It was glorious. And it was filled with gold. And guess what? It was also filled with lions. They had pictures of lions everywhere. Persia, chest and arms of silver, conquered Babylon in 539 BC. It's a fact. It's a fact. Greece conquered Persia in 331 BC. It's a fact. You can go to any history book and verify that. Um, Rome. Conquered Greece, 169. Now, now Rome conquered Greece. It was kind of like, I'm, I'm reading a book on it right now. Um, <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, they had a couple of battles. And Pydna was a big one. But it wasn't the last battle. But it, it was kind of like, it's kind of like the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the end of the Greek Empire. They were, they were toast. Once, once they lost the Battle of Pydna, Greece was toast. But it's not that they had all of Greece at that time. But they had, let's put it this way, they had the juggler. And, uh, and then you have, and so 169, and then Rome lasted for hundreds of years. Hundreds. <laughs> From all the way to 476 AD, right? And then you have Europe. Well, that's the fourth beast. Well, well, well here, here's the point. Um, the point is that these four beasts represent the, the same metals. They're the same thing. Head of gold is Babylon. The lion is Babylon. The arms and breast of uh, chest of silver is, is Persia. That's the, the bear. Okay? Gre um, Greece is the leopard with the four wings. And that was the same as the belly and thighs of brass. And Rome is that horrible, horrible. Be Read any history book about Rome, and they were awful, cruel. Just on, off the chart, cruel. And just, they just devastated everywhere they went. And then you have the divided. You have the toes, the ten toes. And you also have the ten horns. It represents division. Division of the Roman Empire. Okay? Now, let's take a look at this uh, lion, for example. Let's, let's just go again. Let's take a look at these characteristics. Well, we went over that. I already went over that. The, the wings are plucked up, loss of speed. OK, we, we already went over that. Um, the bear is raised up on one side. 
Now, most Bible scholars will tell you what the significance of that is, is that, remember, Darius was a Mede, Cyrus was a Persian. The Medes and Persians united together to conquer Babylon. So they were kind of a dual kingdom. But guess what? The Persians were more powerful, became more powerful than the Medes. So the bear was raised up on a side. See? Isn't that cool? Isn't it amazing how the prophecy, how the descriptions, you know, tell us so much information. You know, the pictures, you know, this, this, these pictorial uh, descriptions of these kingdoms communicate a lot of things that are fascinating. And then it says it has three ribs. Well, we know that made a Persian kingdom conquer three areas. Lydia, Egypt, and Libya. Uh, and Babylon. Babylon. Those three. Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Lydia was the western part of the uh, uh, Asia Minor. You know what Asia Minor is? You know, Turkey today? It's, it was the western part of Turkey. So they conquered those three areas. So we know from history that three ribs in its mouth. And in its prime, the Persian Empire was control of the world. It was a vast empire. In fact, it was bigger than Babylon. See, Babylon was powerful, but it was kind of, but it was geographically wasn't nearly as big as the Persian Empire. So that takes care of the bear, and then you have the, the leopard. Of course, the leopard was fast and agile. Four wings, very fast, four, four heads, division of leadership. And here's a map. This is, the most, this is the most amazing thing about this whole prophecy to me is what happened. You see, Philip of Macedon was the father of, of um, Alexander. He died at a, uh, at a wedding feast. And there's a long story to that. But he was killed. He was murdered. He was assassinated. And Alexander took over. He was about 16 years old. Now, Greece was always fighting among itself. You had the Athenians fighting the Spartans and they were fighting the Macedonians. The Greeks were always fighting among themselves. So the Greeks were kind of like a, they were kind of like a, a, a like, kind of like an Afghanistan out there, you know. <laughs> they were, they, they were a, a, a messed up country. And nobody really took it seriously except Persia wanted to conquer it. And Persia, and Persia tried. Persia tried. And it made the Greeks really angry. And so when, when, Philip, when Philip of Macedon died, Alexander said, I am going to get I am going to get revenge on the Persians. Now, nobody took them seriously. I mean, you know, Greek, Greek is just, you know, they're a messed up country. They're always fighting on themselves. But, but Alexander was able to solidify Greece just enough, just enough, not totally, but just enough, so that he could have, leave a little bit of a, little, a few forces back in the homeland, and then he took off with about, 50, about 30 to 40,000 men. He took off. Granicus, right there where Thrace meets, meets uh, Asia Minor, where meets the Persian Empire, smashed. Smashed the Persian forces. Absolutely destroyed them. And then, one year later, at the Battle of Isis, 333 BC, smashed them again. The whole army, the whole Persian army was just... And then... Um, one of the Dariuses, I forget exactly which one it was, finally, it was another Darius, not Darius the Great. Uh, finally, finally, he got together one last attempt to defeat Alexander the Great, and that was at the Battle of Guacamela, which is called the Battle of Arbella. And this time, he absolutely destroyed the Persian army. There was nothing left. And he took over the whole empire. Now think about it, folks. <laughs> think about it. Three years, three battles. Total conquest. Is that fast? <laughs> In those days, I mean, it took Rome a lot longer than that, you know, to take care of Greece. But Greece, in three years, a little over three years, three battles, complete conquest of the Persian Empire. It's an amazing prophecy. You know, it describes a leopard with wings destroying. You know, I just, it's just, and then we'll get into chapter eight, and it gets even more. It gets even more interesting because it describes the same thing, same battle. It, it, it describes the battle between a, a ram, 
which is the Medo-Persian Empire, and, and, and the goat, which is Greece, and Greece comes from the west and comes flying, doesn't even touch the ground. It says, comes flying over the earth and smashes the, the ram and destroys the ram. We'll read about that in chapter 8. That's next week. So, you know, again, it's repetition and enlargement. Next week, we're going to repeat some of these things about the Persian Empire, and we're also going to get into more detail about the Roman Empire. So Alexander the Great, at the age of 16, took over from Philip, Philip of Macedon. No one took him seriously, just a punk. But God had directed affairs, and he came to clean the clock. He came to clean a Persian's clock, because he, they were furious. They were furious at, uh, they were furious at the Persians, because the Persians had conquered all, you know, all those Greek, all those islands, on, in the, on, the, on the west side of Asia Minor. Those were all Greek. And the Persians took them. They were mad. So how many horns did the fourth beast have? Ten horns, exactly. And Rome lasted a really, really long time. But who took over Rome? What country took over Rome? None. It divided up. Fascinating history. You know, if you ever read Ed, Edward Gibbon, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, I've got another book in my library about the fall of the Roman Empire by Peter Heather. It was the barbarians. It was the barbarians. They were north of the Danube River. And, and according to this author, he says that the north of the Danube River, they had these barbarian tribes, German tribes, and they were always there, but they were not very organized, and they weren't as, they weren't as numerous but as time went on, you see, they interacted with, the, his, this is fascinating, they interacted with the Romans. They learned how to organize like the Romans. And when they learned how to organize like the Romans, they defeated the Romans. They came across the river and they smashed them. The battle of, uh, there was a famous, famous battle. Uh, Valens was defeated. I, I forget the name of the battle. But anyway, around 378. Maybe you can remember. It was a famous battle. And the barbarians came across the, the Danube River and destroyed the Roman army. So, it, so instead of, but there were lots of barbarian tribes, right? There wasn't just one. And so what happened is uh, these various barbarian tribes eventually parceled up the Roman Empire. And basically the 10 pieces. Now, you know, you can argue the point, but basically 10 pieces. You have the Franks, became French. Let's see. The Germans, the Alemanni. You know, by the way, I'm learning Spanish, and Aleman in, in Spanish is German, right? Right? <laughs> it is. And the Lombards uh, became the Italians. The Burgundians, the Burgundies became the Swiss. The Visigoths became the Spanish. The Portuguese became the Suevi. And the Anglo Saxons became the British. Now, there were three that went extinct. And the prophecy says that they would go extinct. There were three that were uprooted. We'll, talk, we'll read about that. And those are the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. So you don't hear about the Heruli, you don't hear about the Ostrogoths. So here we're just a review here. We have Babylon from 605 to 539, Medo Persia from 539 to 331, Greece from 331 to 168, uh, and then Rome 168 to 476. And then you have the fall of Rome. Rome actually began falling, you know. Mm. Yeah, around 410, 410, Rome was sacked, right? And then you had, a, you had a period of time where the Vandals attacked Rome. And so you, then, you had, then you had Attila the Hun come over, and he, he, wiped, out, he wiped out all the Italian peninsula. So, so when Rome fell, no one nation took over, right? But there were ten horns. And those ten horns represented the divisions, just like the ten toes represented the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. Now, there's a new power that arises in, in chapter 7, verse 8. I was looking at the horns, you know, I was considering the horns, there's ten horns, and he saw something that really interested him. There was another horn, a little one coming up among them. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. There they are, those three kingdoms. That, that little horn, this new power that comes up, destroyed those vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. 
amazing. <laughs> and it describes this guy. It describes this new power. It's a little horn. And where does it arise? It arises among, it says, comes up among the ten kingdoms. Right? It comes up among them. In other words, the ten kingdoms come first, but then there's this other, other new, uh, kind of an upstart horn that kind of pushes three aside and establishes itself as a powerful horn. Came up among the other horns. Now, the question is, did the little horn rise before or after the divisions of the Roman Empire? Well, after. Describes the ten horns and then describes the little, describes the little one. All right? Question seven. After the breakup of the Roman Empire. Now, how did the prophet Dan describe the eyes of this power, right? What? This little horn had eyes, right? And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. Now, notice, we've been talking about animals, right? This horn does not have the eyes of an animal. It has the eyes of a man. So this is different. Daniel, you know, the Bible is trying to tell us something here. This horn is important. Eyes of a man. How did Daniel compare this little horn to the first ten horns? He shall be different from the first ones. So the horn, this one's different. We're going to find out how it is different. We're going to find out how it is different. What are the three characteristics of the power of this power that Daniel described in verse 25? Well, here is, here are the clues. He speaks pompous words against the Most High. Now this power is arrogant and we'll find out later blasphemous. It challenges the authority of the Most High. It challenges the authority of heaven and of the God of heaven. Okay? It persecutes the saints. In other words, those who are truly devout in trying to keep God's commandments and follow his will, it attacks them. So this is an anti-God power. And it intends to change the times and law. Well, God has a law. What law does he have? Ten commandments. He wants to change the law so that people don't follow the law that they break it. He wants to lead people into rebellion. This is an anti-God power. That's why it gets so much attention. Because it is opposed to everything that heaven is about. And it says, and this is one of the saddest, this is one of the saddest verses for me. The saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. In other words, this little horn power defeats God's people for a period of time. It persecutes them and it wins. The bad guy wins. You know, I remember growing up watching all those westerns, you know. The good guys always win. Not in this story. The bad guys win. Okay, so just to review, speaks pompous words, arrogant, blasphemous words against the Most High, persecutes God's true people. Is this sounding like the Antichrist, folks? At all? Huh? Intend to change the times and law, trying to change God's law, wants to lead people in rebellion, wants to lead people to disobey the law. Now, we're going to jump over to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was probably the great, well, was the greatest apostle of Christ. Probably the greatest Christian that ever lived, of course, except for Christ. And he warned people, the, his, his followers, he warned them that the time was going to come 
when there would be what we call in, in the Christian faith an apostasy. Apostasy means, it just means a turning away, a rejection. And this is, this is what he said. He said, take heed to yourselves and to the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. In other words, Satan was going to attack the church, God's people. He's going to do it through people. Like, and they were being like savage wolves. They were going to lead people away from God's commandments. Lead them to rebellion. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking per perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Now why do people do that? If they draw away from Jesus, they draw away from truth, what's their purpose? Usually two things, money and power. Right? Usually money and power. He warned them, this is just summarizing these verses, he warned them that people would attempt to destroy the church of God. And what did the apostle describe in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4? This is again another warning the apostle gave. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, what does that mean? What is that day? That day is the second coming of Jesus. See, the Christians, the early Christians were looking forward to the coming of Jesus because remember, when he left them, he said, what did he say? I will come again. John 14. And when he left them, he said, you know, he said, the angel said, why do, you, why do you gaze up? He'll come in the same manner. He'll come back. So the early Christians were looking forward. They thought Jesus was going to come back in just a few years. Right away. Well, you know, it's been a delay, right? <laughs> been a delay. <laughs> Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. The day of my returning will not come until something happens. What is that? The falling away comes first. The Bible predicted. Paul predicted there will be a falling away in the church. In the church. See, we're, so many people looking for the Antichrist outside of the church. Folks, it was it happened in the church. In the church. There will be a falling away. And the man of sin will be revealed. Because the man of sin is going to be revealed within the communion of believers. And notice this. You know, I, I, this, this is amazes me. But the modern theories about the second coming of Jesus are that he comes and there's a rapture and then the man of sin appears. The Antichrist appears. Apostle Paul says, no way. The man of sin, the Antichrist, comes before, not after. So be careful what you, you know, test what you believe by the scriptures. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He comes before Jesus comes. He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is a, a, this is a power that aspires the power of God. Aspires to be God. So the apostle described this apostasy as when man exalts himself above God. And what did Daniel declare what happened, would happen to the truth? He would cast truth down to the ground. Okay? This little horn power gets a lot of attention in chapter 8. So come back next week, okay? Because chapter 8, we're gonna, is, uh, uh, Rob's going to take us into a lot of detail about this power. Because the Bible is focused on this power. This is, this is a power that is the great enemy of God's people. How long would this power reign supreme? Now, now, now follow this closely. Follow this very carefully. I, I, don't, I don't want you to miss this. It says, the saint shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, how long is that? Well, let's jump ahead to Revelation. See, Revelation, Dan and Revelation go together. They're like hand and glove. And the little horn power in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel 8 
are the same power that you see in Revelation. The sea beast power. Okay? They're the same. We'll, I'll prove it to you in a minute. Uh, partially. We'll get into more detail later. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. Why? To preserve her from the persecution that was taking place. This little horn persecuted God's people. So it's the woman is the church, right? We, we studied that. The woman is the church. She fled into the wilderness. Now the wilderness is symbolic of desolate places on the earth where people could hide. You know, the wall of seas. Hid for hundreds of years in the Alps to escape persecution. That they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, what's this 1,260 days all about? Well, let's, let's go to another verse. The woman, again, the church, this is chapter, chapter 12, verse 14. The woman was given wings of an eagle, great eagle, that she should fly to the wilderness where she would be nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent, the devil. The serpent is the devil. Of course, he works through the horn power, through the sea beast. Now, a time in, according to scholars, a time represents a year. Two times, two years. And half a time, half a year. And if you add that up, if you add it up, it comes out, and if, if, you, can, if you take 360 days to be a year, which Bible scholars say that's the way it works, you've got 1,260 years. So, you have to, you also have, there's one other key point, and that is that in Bible prophecy, with outline prophecies, these time prophecies, a day equals a year. See, that's one of the keys to breaking the code. The, Daniel and Revelation are written in a code. And one of the keys to the code is this principle. Ezekiel 4, 6 says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now, you can read that in context and you get the, get the meaning of it. Uh, basically, he told Ezekiel to lie on his side. He laid on his side for a certain period of time, on his left side. And then he said, okay, I've appointed you a day for a year. And then, in Numbers 14.34, that's when the Israelites refused to go into the... You know, they spied the land for 40, 40 days, right? They spied the land. They refused to go in. And God says, okay, you'll wander in the wilderness for 40 years. A day, a year, for a day. So, many Bible scholars apply that to this prophecy. Now, in Revelation 13, 5, it talks about this sea beast. It's the same power, folks. Like, well, you'll study it. We'll study it. We'll prove it later. But in 13, 5, there's this beast power that speaks mouth, has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He, he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Well, what's 42 months? Well, Times 30 days, 1,260. That 1,260 shows up 11 times. 11 times in Scripture. 11 times. It's very significant. Bible is saying something terrible happened during that 1,060 days. This little horn power persecuted God's people for 1,260 years. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is a horrible power. This is an antichrist power. All who dwell on the earth shall worship him. Can you imagine? The whole world is going to be deceived and follow the beast. Worship the beast whose names have not been written in the book of life or the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. That's what, that's what the verse says. Now, who is this little horned beast? Little horned power and beast. You'll have to wait until next week to find out. We're going to go in. He's going to, Rob's, going to, Rob's going to lay it out for you. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 will identify this. So, Okay, so now we're just going to go on to a couple of other verses here. It says, what is God's answer to the battle for the throne of the earth? Daniel 7, 9, and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days was seated. 
a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand ministered to him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The courts were seated. The court was seated. The books were open. You know, the Bible talks about the Bible talks about books. Now I'm sure that God has pretty sophisticated electronic up in heaven, you know. Why does he use books? Well, because we know what books are. God uses our language to communicate to us, you know. When the, you know, 100 years ago, we didn't have tablets and, you know, computers, but we had books. But the point is that records are kept. The good news is that in the judgment, if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Christ's righteousness stands in your place. And instead of guilty, it says innocent. That's wonderful. The whole purpose of the judgment, folks, is not to find out that you're guilty. It's to find out that you're innocent. Those that have Jesus Christ as their Savior are, have written, their names are written in the book of life. Remember the disciples? They went out. Jesus told the disciples to go out. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure the deaf. And they did. He gave them power. And they came back and said, Master, you should have seen what happened. <laughs> the demons left. The blind were healed. The dead were raised. Wow. And Jesus, what did you say to them? Don't rejoice that you have power. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. That's why you should rejoice. Yeah? So God keeps records. But the purpose of the records are to see who has Jesus, who is trusting in. If you're trusting in Jesus, folks, the judgment is good news. The judgment is good news. I mean, if you're accused and you know you're innocent, don't you want a judgment? Don't you want to have a jury say you're innocent? That's what heaven's doing. Because the devil, you know the Bible says the devil accuses us day and night. Accuses us day and night, even while you're sleeping. <laughs> even while you can't do anything wrong when you're sleeping, right? But even while you're sleeping, he accuses us day and night. But the judgment is to show that you're trusting that in Jesus as your Savior. That's good news. Judgment is good news, folks. Never be afraid of judgment. God opens the book so everyone can see that he is the rightful ruler and that he's making righteous judgments. What phrases did Daniel use to tell us that God's kingdom is permanent? Well, it is forever. It's a forever kingdom. It says in, 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 in verse 14, his dominion is everlasting which shall not pass away. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So, we have this little horn power. Now, you know, it's kind of ironic because this little horn power attacks the sanctuary. Now, Babylon attacks the sanctuary. Remember? It, it took the vessels from the sanctuary. This little horn power attacks the heavenly sanctuary. We'll read about that in chapter 8. Attacks the heavenly sanctuary. But, God wins the battle. God wins. Babylon is destroyed. Babylon, both, both the ancient Babylon and spiritual Babylon. You see, this little horn power is really what spiritual Babylon is in, in, in Revelation. You read about Babylon all throughout Revelation. It all talks about Babylon. Babylon, 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 Babylon. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. Why Babylon? Well, because Babylon was the enemy of God's people in the Old Testament, and it's the enemy of God's people in the New Testament. Except, except, except it being a country, it's a system, a spiritual Power. See? It says, His kingdom and dominion last forever. So just before the return of Jesus, there will be a final call back to truth. God will call men and, back, and women back to obedience to his law. Because remember, the attack of this little horn, Antichrist power, is the law. Now, we're not saved by keeping the law, folks. Right? We're not saved by keeping the law. But God has a law. He, and we should respect it. And we should follow it to the best of our ability. But the little horn power is trying to destroy the law. He tries to change the law. He wants to turn people away from keeping the law. We're not saved by following by obedience. We're saved by Jesus. But because we love him, we do our best to keep his law. Right? Okay. Father in heaven, we, thank, we know that there's a battle. There's been battles going on for a long time. These beast powers have tried to conquer each other and they try to destroy God's people. But we know that your dominion is going to last. It's going to come. Your kingdom is going to come and 
It's going to destroy all those earthly powers. Lord, we want to be in, we want to be in those kingdom, in your kingdom. We want to be saved, and we know that we are saved by Jesus. Amen.